Hello, church. My name is Chandra Stiles. I'm one of the youth pastors here at Forest Grove Community Church, Attridge, and I'm excited to be meeting with you in this way this morning. Hopefully this morning, however you're gathering, whether it's in your home with your family, or maybe with your roommates, or maybe it's on your own in a single person dwelling or just watching by yourself, however you're coming, I, I hope and I pray that you can feel a sense of gathering with our whole church body as you watch this morning. Um, this morning we're going to share some ministry stories of things that are going on in our youth and young adults ministries at our site. Uh, we're going to hear a message from Pastor Bruce on Kingdom Economics in the series that we've been in for some time now. And then we'll end off with uh, a prayer and a benediction, which is just a blessing to leave you with as you go. So I hope and pray this is an encouragement to you today. So now we're in our family ministries room, which is the room that facilitates our Grove Youth programs on Tuesday nights and Friday nights. And I'm joined here with my friend Spencer, who's six feet away from me, uh, who's the senior high pastor as well as the young adults pastor. We just want to share with you some of the ways that Jesus has been working in our Grove Youth and Young Adult communities during this COVID season. So at Grove Youth, our mission is to know and experience and follow Jesus together. And normally at youth, we do that through a bunch of different ways like games and teaching uh, and worship and snack and small groups and stuff like that. And obviously, like everyone else in this universe, uh, that has changed now. Um, so we've been trying to do that uh, online, trying to do it digitally, trying to do it virtually. So we've been doing um, some small groups for a, a while, either on Zoom or another platform where um, small groups are still able to meet together and we put out a teaching video for them and some discussion questions for them to go over that together. We've been doing large group meetings uh, as well, which have been very hectic and a lot of work, but so fun um, to see all of our youth kids and leaders all together on one screen on Zoom. Um, so that we try to make that feel like a regular youth night. So we do the same things. We do a game, we do announcements, we do some teaching, some shout outs where we can hear what's going on in the lives of each other. We do some uh, some live worship as well. And, and uh, it's been it's been awesome. It's been a, it's been a good attempt uh, and then we'll refine it as we go, but it's been really fun. Um, something else we've been trying to do is to continue to engage kids every day on a platform like Instagram. So we have these daily features. Sometimes it's just sermon discussion questions. Sometimes it's something called Coffee in the Word. Sometimes it's a fun game that we all play together. Sometimes it's school. So on Saturdays, we do something called Saturday School where leaders can teach things like um, how to make soup or how to make um, little stuffed animal frogs or how to speak Spanish, that kind of thing. Those are all things that we've done. Um, and those have been a really cool way to engage uh, kids online as best that we can. Um, Jandra, we've talked about uh, this being something brand new for you. What are some of your highlights that you've experienced so far? Yeah, so it's been interesting taking everything online. One of the things that we do in our high school ministry is something called Coffee in the Word, which is a morning Bible study that happens on Thursdays at the local Starbucks. Um, and we've taken that online to Zoom on Thursday afternoons. Um, and we've actually replicated it in our junior high ministry as well on Wednesday afternoons. And we've never had a junior high Bible study like this before, just because we didn't want to add another thing for parents to take their kids to. Um, but it's actually been a really, really cool, rich place for us to come together to read the Word of God together and to talk about Jesus. Um, especially in our junior high ministry, it's been so cool to see students who might not normally interact come together and disciple one another and share with each other how they're seeing Jesus at work in the scripture they're reading, but also in their own lives. I've been really, really encouraged by it. Um, also, we've had the, the, fun, um, the fun challenge of integrating new students into our programs. So we've actually had students uh, message us and say, I've never come to your youth before, but I want to grow in my relationship with Jesus in this time. How do I do that? And so it's been cool to figure out how to try to connect them and get them to be part of our community while we're not meeting. Um, one of my personal favorite highlights has been worshiping together. We've actually been having live worship. Our worship leaders in both junior high and senior high have been leading worship over Zoom or over Instagram Live. And it's just been kind of this cool image of all of us worshiping in our houses around the city um, together apart. And so that's been something that's just been really, really good for my heart. Spence, what have been some of your highlights in this time? So uh, as Chan mentioned, I'm also the Young Adults Pastor. So our Young Adults program has been uh, in small groups this year, as well as meeting uh, in large groups together. So uh, when all these things got put on pause, I had a conversation with my leaders about pausing their small groups. And uh, about a week later, they came back to me and we had another conversation. And they said, you know, we, we think it's valuable to keep going. And some of them were actually meeting online already. Uh, and so it's been really great to hear them unanimously say like, hey, we're going to continue meeting 
on Zoom or however they want to do it because they see so much value in that. Another thing is actually just been able to see how these small groups, even at youth and young adults, have gotten so real with each other. You know, it's been a month. It's been over a month now that we've all been, you know, kind of condemned to our houses. And people are starting to open up and just say, this is really hard. This is really hard for me. And some of the, the students who maybe wouldn't have said things like that before or been that open are being more open now because they just are desperate for some kind of conversation, which has been sad, but really great that they're opening up and that we're, being, we're able to connect with them on a really deep level, which has been really cool. Another thing that's uh, maybe not quite on the same deep level is we've been able to uh, bless some of our kids creatively. So in youth ministry, a lot of times after a game, there's a prize. Um, we wanted to try and continue that as best we could. Uh, and so we had a, a game the other night at senior high where one of our kids uh, got the option between two prizes he wanted to win. And he had never had a blizzard before. And that was one of the options. So we were able to order him a blizzard on Skip the Dishes and have it delivered to his house. And they did contactless delivery. Uh, and before the end of the night, we saw him on his camera eating his blizzard. And it was really cool to see that, you know, we can still connect that way uh, and surprise him and bless him in that way as well. Um, we've got some, some conversations, uh, some clips from some of our youth and leaders um, and young adults as well who wanted to share a little bit about what's been going on in their lives. And so uh, we want to kick those to you now so you can see uh, what's been going on for them during all of this as well. During this time of COVID-19, I've been encouraged by my Grove Youth community um, because of the way that they've cared for each other. Thinking about my own small group girls, they've just spoken words of life and encouragement into each other and into me as their leader. Um, they've had fun together, playing games over Zoom and having dance parties over Zoom. Um, and I've just been so encouraged and so cared for in my walk with Jesus because of that. My Grove Youth highlight from this season has been my small group sending each other videos over text. It's been awesome to see each other, keep in contact, make each other laugh, and to encourage each other through the highs and lows. Hi, Forest Grove Community Church. This is the Coffee in the Word group where we read through the Bible. Right now we're reading through 1 Corinthians and we just discuss about Jesus, pray, and yeah, follow the Lord. Hi. <laughs> One of my highlights from Grove Youth this past season has been seeing that God is still moving in our young people and there is a desire for community and that our young students are still making an effort to be a part of it and to want to stay connected to one of us. Uh, but a big highlight for me, especially like these last couple weeks is what we've been doing as a small group is we'll just like get together and video chat and talk about life and stuff. And um, once a week, one of the kids will take a turn doing a talent show. So then uh, we'll get together and talk and then they'll do a little talent show and show us something cool. And they've been pretty creative. It's been it's been fun to see. Something I definitely miss most about the Grove Youth community right now has got to be the people and the relationships I've developed with them over the past few years. And also it has to be the worship. It doesn't feel I'll be there on a Tuesday night and I'll be left with a spiritual high like you can't find anywhere else. Well, there you go. Um, you can keep some of those things in mind as you pray. And we just want to maybe throw out a couple more things that you can be praying for in the lives of our youth and young adults. Uh, one is for our grade 8s and our grade 12s. Um, this was supposed to be a big ending to their respective school years, you know. And uh, for them now, that's different. It's very different. There's been a lot of ramp up to this last year of elementary school or, or high school. And it's, it's just done. It's just done for them. And so I know that they're feeling some grief over that. So you can pray for them. Another thing uh, is our, our university students are, st are still in finals, many of them too. So you can pray for them as they're um, doing a lot of online school and trying to figure out how they're going to do exams this way. Um, they have finals coming up and we'd love for you to pray for them. The third one is something that's actually very close to our youth and young adults ministry um, is, is camps. Summer camps are, are a big deal to a lot of us. Um, I know I, I became a Christian at camp, and so that's where I met Jesus for the first time. Um, and now a lot of camps around, around Saskatchewan, around Canada, probably around the world, are very unsure as to whether they can actually continue this summer. So um, Kadish and Redbury would be two of the camps that we're cl most closely related to here. Um, so keep them in your prayers. Um, they uh, are obviously missing out on rental income right now and potentially won't even have the opportunity to run camp this summer. So please pray for them. Um, that's a, an amazing ministry. That, that has God moving in such huge ways and uh, even has brought you to youth pastors. Yeah, so thank you so much for the way that you've been supporting us through encouragement and prayer. Thank you parents for navigating all the technology and um, the computer sharing and all of those types of things. We're so thankful for the way you're supporting your students. Um, please keep praying for us. 
um, and just be in celebration over what Jesus is doing in our, our youth and our young adults during this time. Uh, now we're going to hear a message from Pastor Bruce. Good morning, church. Well, this is the week that follows Easter Sunday. And maybe you're feeling somewhat scattered and maybe even a little bit isolated and alone. Uh, not just maybe because of the pandemic, but because of just coming through an Easter experience, whatever that experience was. And every one of us has experienced something this past Easter that was unlike anything that we have probably experienced before. Maybe you're somebody who watched our video service or engaged in some aspect of our church over this past weekend, uh, maybe for the first time. And if that was you, I am so glad that you joined us and that you're joining us here again today. Uh, maybe that maybe you're somebody who has actually been part of our church community for a long time. And maybe you too are asking questions like, what does this all mean? Uh, what does it all mean to live in this current pandemic that we're in? But what does it all mean even to live out of resurrection hope? And so those first disciples had a bit of a similar experience. If you read the accounts at the end of the Gospels and at the beginning of the book of Acts, you see the disciples after the tomb was empty, wondering, Jesus, where are you? What does this all mean? What has actually happened here? Those early disciples witnessed very evidently the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. They saw that he died. They saw him placed in a tomb. And then they also went to that tomb that Sunday morning and saw that it was empty. And then they kind of scattered and were in isolation, in small groups. They were maybe living in fear and they were going through a time of doubt and disorientation. And what's so encouraging about the story as you read that at the end of the Gospels is Jesus goes and finds them and meets them where they're at and meets them in their doubt and their disillusionment and their disorientation. And that's the truth of the risen Jesus that we worship and the power of the resurrection that he is a living God and he comes and he meets us very much where we're at. And I sometimes wonder if that time between when the tomb was empty and when Jesus encountered those disciples, if, if they maybe experienced a little bit of the kingdom of God in the sense of the kingdom that is now and not yet. They, they sort of knew what was going on and now they were totally wondering, okay, what now? Jesus, where are you? And then Jesus meets them and encounters them. And we too, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we experience this kingdom in a now and not yet kind of way where Jesus has returned to his Father, and now we await his second coming, his return to us, and we, we see glimpses of the kingdom, and we wonder, okay, God, what is this all about? What is happening? And even now in our world today, we, we see that so much is going on that is confusing, disorienting, and we wonder, God, where is your kingdom? But the encouragement is, is that God's kingdom is here. God's kingdom is among us. And I just pray that in this season, maybe even this week coming out of Easter, that God would encourage you, that God would come alive to you, that you would know the risen Jesus who pursues you and comes and meets you where you're at. This week, I want to bring it close to a series that we've been in called Kingdom Economics. We were in this series prior to Easter, quite a number of weeks ago, before everything in the world changed. And we took a bit of a different course over the last weeks, as we know. But a number of weeks ago, we were in this series looking at the kingdom of God and trying to understand how do we think about money and the kingdom of God uh, together. Uh, and so I want to step back into that and actually bring a closure to that series and just do the last message of that here today. We were looking at this series, particularly in the area of giving. And what is our theology of giving? What does that look like? And we've been following an outline that has basically been uh, this handout. And uh, we see that handout uh, here in the, the slides here where we, we had six statements that we've been walking through over the, the course of the last number of weeks uh, prior to when things changed. And uh, let me just remind us of, of what those six are and we'll end with the last one here today. First of all, in this brochure that you can access, and we're going to give a link to this uh, also on the email, uh, it says how everything belongs to God. And this truth that we are actually called to be stewards of all that God has given us, but it all actually belongs to him. Secondly, that giving our money is an act of worship. And what that means is that we give with no strings attached. We don't coerce it or, or, or micromanage it. We, we give and we just give to God. And that includes even when we give to the church of just releasing and saying, God, this is your money. All that we have is yours and we give as an act of worship. And then thirdly, our giving reveals and aligns and grows our heart allegiances. 
And we know that to be true because we know that if you look at somebody's bank account or their statement and where they give it, it gives some evidence of what's going on within our hearts. And then also this truth that it, re- it, it, it not only reveals things, but it aligns our hearts and it also helps to grow our heart allegiances because Jesus says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so we've seen that to be true as well. We also talked about the fact that the tithe isn't required, but it can be helpful. And we looked at Old Testament or Old Covenant uh, texts and teaching on the tithe for the people of Israel alongside of the New Testament text. And what does the New Testament say about how we think about the tithe? And the truth that even though as New Covenant people, it's not, not required of us, it is a helpful, it can be really helpful in our spiritual disciplines in this area of giving. And so when you think about New Covenant principles, you might ask, well, what is required of us? And that's where this acronym I find has been helpful for me, JGSP. And it just simply reminds us that our giving in the New Testament is to be joyful, it's to be generous, it's to be sacrificial, and it's to be proportional. And then the last part of this outline is just the fact that giving starts with the local church. And that's the part that we want to focus on today, that that giving starts with the local church. And we want to look at that in a few ways. So first of all, I just need to give a disclaimer. Uh, In organizational life, oftentimes we think about a conflict of interest and we say, okay, we have to declare conflicts of interest. Uh, You can't always eliminate them, but you have to at least acknowledge them and you have to try to manage them in some way. Conflict of interest is when somebody can have a personal benefit from something that is from decisions that are made or teachings that are done or whatever. And so here's the disclaimer, conflict of interest. My salary comes from church, people giving to the church. So I I recognize that, just putting that out there. But still, we want to teach about what does the Bible say and how do we understand about giving uh, to the local church. And in this outline, and if you want to get a hold of this, there's a whole bunch of scripture verses that can help you kind of guide through and go through that in a lot of detail. I want to just touch on a few things that God's put in my heart for, for this week. God's called us to be generous, to be extravagantly generous with our lives, with our money. Again, as we said, to give joyfully, generously, sacrificially, and proportionally. And a lot of times we give to people and we give to good organizations where there is need and where we see people and organizations doing a lot of kingdom good and making a difference in the world, and that's a good thing. But there's something uniquely about the church. There's something uniquely about the expressed local gatherings that is just really close to the heart of God. And it's the church being so central to God's mission in the world. And so this whole idea of giving uh, as followers of Jesus, needing to start there, I think is a principle that we see throughout the New Testament. But here's the thing. In order to do that, you actually have to love the church. You have to truly love the church. You have to honor the church. You want to have the best for the church. You want to do whatever you can to build and equip and support and encourage the church to step into its identity and to step into its true calling. You see, Jesus loved the church. He gave his life for her. And in the New Testament, it's referred to, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom, willing to lay down his life. And he did lay down his life for this church. The church is also referred to as the body of Christ, where where each of us are members of this body, connected by this connective tissue, and uh, each of us doing our part, using our gifts, and expressing our love for each other, and, and doing God's work together in the unique ways that God has wired us to play a part and to play a role. No matter whether your role seems significant or small, whether it's in front of things or behind things, but your role matters. And so the idea that if your giving is just out of obligation or out of duty, it's pretty soon going to feel like empty worship. When we give to the local church, it has to come out of a deep love, actually, for the church that God has put in place and this agency that God has put in motion to fuel his mission and to lead his mission in the world. I've shared before that uh, I've sometimes thought about, well, how would I answer if somebody asked me, you know, how would you change the world? What would you do if you wanted to change the world? And my answer to that is I've given a lot of thought of that is the same today as it was back then when I was first asked the question. And that is, I I would serve and lead in the local church. Because I can't imagine anything that actually can make a bigger difference in the world if the church is healthy and functioning the way that it's supposed to be. I would want to see people engage together to to serve and proclaim this hope of the gospel to other people. 
I would want to see people experience the love of Christ and then to model it to other people as well. I would want to see people being transformed into the hope of the gospel of Jesus, to help people understand God's big story and to see how their own story fits within God's story. And and those things uh, really motivate me. They give me a deep love for the church and and help me to, to see and imagine a church that can actually make a huge difference in the world. And when we give to the local church, we have to believe that that is part of what God has in mind. That is what God has had in mind, that the church would function in this way. I truly believe that a healthy, functioning, spirit-filled church can change the world more than anything else. And it happens in local expressions all over the world of just small bodies of believers who actually take hold of this gospel, allow it to transform them, and then proclaim it and live it to the people around them and literally to the ends of the earth. But then it begs the question, what is the church? And I think that's a question that we've been probably asking more today and in these last weeks than ever before. I know many of us have, and just going, okay, so what what is at the essence of the church? You know, the the church and the kingdom, are those the same thing? Well, no, the kingdom of God is much bigger than the church. The church is part of the kingdom, but the kingdom of God is, is more than that. We know that the church isn't a building. We've experienced that so profoundly in these weeks, haven't we? We can't actually gather in a building. So does that mean that the church doesn't exist? Well, no, the church exists. The, does that mean that the church is empty? No, the building is empty, but the church is still the church. We gather and we scatter. And so we know that the, the church is God's people. It's not the building. We also know that the church isn't just about Sunday mornings. The church isn't about a corporate worship gathering, what we often think about when we think about the church. And we're used to that rhythm of coming together. And as much as that's important and it matters, that's the ecclesia. That is the church gathered, the assembly, gathered for a purpose. But we're the church that gathers and then we're also the church that scatters. And we know that today it's, it's really hard to gather. And so we gather in electronic forms and in, in some way, and we're feeling more scattered and probably more isolated than ever before. But we know that the church scattered is also the church because Jesus, he, he set in motion and he gave us this great commission. And he said in Matthew 28 that he says, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth and therefore go and make disciples. And so Jesus called the church to go. He called the church to scatter. He says, you need to go. And even as you read the accounts in Acts, the church scattered from Jerusalem outward. And so the scattered church is still the church. In fact, that's really important. And he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey the commands that I have given you, and to be sure of this, that I am with you always, even unto the ends of the age. And so we as a church get to join Abraham's call in Genesis 12 of bringing the blessing of God to the nations of the world. And so we come back to this question of what does it mean to be the church? What is the church? It is so much more than just when we gather. It is definitely not the building. It is the the body of Christ functioning and acting together by his spirit. You know, the church is built on Jesus. He is the foundation. He is the bridegroom of the church. In Matthew 16, uh, Peter was asked the question and he was, Jesus was talking to the disciples and saying, so who is it that people say that I am? And they gave some answers and then Jesus asked Peter pointedly and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said this, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then when Peter said that, Jesus affirmed him. In fact, he even pointed to his name, which points to the truth of this rock that he says. And he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this rock of truth that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, he is going to build his church. And so Jesus is the foundation. The church is this ecclesia again, this gathering of people, assembly of people who gather for a purpose. And so Jesus is essentially setting himself up against the temple and all that the temple meant for the people of Israel. As the people thought about the temple in Jerusalem, and Jesus is now setting himself up against that and saying, this is now the temple of God, the body of people that come together. And he's setting something really different in motion. You see it in Ephesians 2 where the Apostle Paul is talking about this. And he says, so now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. 
We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. So the church is God's people infused with the spirit of God. And it's just so important for us to remember that. As people are gathered, as people are scattered, but it's this spirit of God living within and among God's people. But the interesting thing is that as long as the church exists, it's really easy for us to lose our way, isn't it? We can so often get distracted, miss our calling, miss our purpose, just like the people of Israel did. And they were constantly being called back to be the church. And so we are called to give generously to the church, but we are also called to give generously through the church. And make sure that we understand that the church is not an end unto itself. It's not the end point of all things. It's actually a channel through which God's blessing is to flow to the people of the earth. You know, this pandemic is testing every single church at its foundation about what it's about, what its purposes are, and how it will be God's witness in the world. And our church as well. Why do we exist? What is our purpose? How do we best accomplish that? How do we as a church live generously to those around us who have great need? Our council and our staff, together we are asking these questions, and I hope you are too. We invite you to continue to pray into that with us and join with us in the months ahead to, to think about that and make decisions around that. I read an article recently that said that one of the misleading cliches of this pandemic is that, we're, that it treats us all the same. And the reality is, is that's not true. This pandemic treats people very differently. People in poor neighborhoods, people who live in close quarters, people who live in refugee camps, people who have no masks, people who have no running water to wash their hands, uh, people who didn't have jobs or food before the pandemic. I mean, all of these people are feeling and experiencing these things far greater than so many of us, aren't they? And so this inequality in health and even this inequality in economy is very real and the results of that will be felt for a long, long time. So given that, how will we be the church? The type of church worth giving generously to and worth worth giving generously through. It's not just about moving our programs or our services online. That's good and necessary, but It's really about living and proclaiming the generosity of God to the nations of the world in extravagant, sacrificial worship. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, in these were verses that we looked at a number of uh, weeks ago, where he talked about giving in proportion to what you have, that JGSP uh, part of the acronym. And he says, give eagerly and joyfully. And he says, there should be some equality in, in caring for others. And he says, right now you have plenty and you can help those who are in need, but Later, they will have plenty, and they can help those who are in need. So Paul's saying we need to think about things differently from a kingdom perspective when it comes to our money. How do we care for those who are poor and marginalized? In chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, uh, he goes on and he says this. He says, remember, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will give generously. He'll generously provide all that you need. And then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. You know, it strikes me that some of the very first responses in the book of Acts of that early church to receiving the powerful indwelling of the Holy Spirit was generous giving. They gave generously to those in need all around them. They gave to the poor. They shared with each other. The Spirit of God overwhelmed them with what they had been given, and so they shared generously with other people. And so as we think about this idea of giving starts with the local church It's even made me think differently of it in this past week, of even using that phrase differently. Maybe it isn't so much giving to the church, but maybe it is more about giving through the church. And giving starts with the local church being the church, actually, and living generously, giving generously, and engaging in God's mission in the world, especially with those who are poor and marginalized. And I pray that God would lead us to all kinds of ways that we can live in response to that. 
God gave everything. That was the truth of the Easter message, that God so loved us that he gave his one and only son. We worship and serve a God who loves extravagantly and calls us to live in a very similar way. Those are the kind of kingdom economics that we need to press into, that we need to embrace, and that we need to live into. And I pray that we could be the beautiful bride of Christ, that we could be the kind of church that is a church that brings the blessing of God to the nations of the world. Amen. As we end off, I'd love to leave you with some words of encouragement and and challenge and blessing for this time that we're in. As we think about this season of kingdom life in the now and not yet kingdom, where we are hoping and praying and waiting for Jesus to restore and renew all things, but we're not yet living in the fullness of that. Um, There's some words from Hebrews that have been an encouragement to me in this time and I've been sharing with our our youth and our youth leaders that I want to share with you. Hebrews 11, 23 to 25 says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your kingdom. We thank you for a kingdom that is uh, far above all of the, the systems and the structures and the kingdoms of this world. We thank you for a kingdom that is marked by new life and restoration and goodness and healing. And we thank you, Jesus, that you invite us to know this kingdom. I pray in this time that you would be stirring within us to, um, to just continue to hold on to the hope that we have in you and in that kingdom. That God, as we have doubts or as we have questions, Lord, that we would feel the freedom to just bring those things to you, to come to you and to ask you in to our questioning, and that we'd feel your nearness in that process. Lord, I pray that we would have our eyes fixed on things that are are bigger than the things that are right in front of us, and that we would remind each other of of the truth of who you are and what you do for us, Um, that we would speak out these words of affirmation and encouragement to um, build each other up as we face these, these difficult times and these times of waiting. Lord, I pray we be people that spur each other on towards acts of love and good works, that in this time that we would embrace a call to generosity and to sacrifice and to giving and to caring for one another. God, that you'd open our eyes to the needs of our community and to one another and that you would um, spur us on to um, to just love each other and serve each other in ways that are, are valuable in this time and are safe, of course, for the capacities that we have. Um, And I pray, Lord, that in this time that we would really um, just anchor ourselves on the hope of what is to come, that you are God who promises to make all things new again. And so, God, would our hearts just be um, hoping and praying to see your power in this time. Holy Spirit, would you be stirring within us to know how to, to live out the kingdom life here and now? And God, would we just trust in your sovereignty? Lord, we love you. We worship you. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for gathering this morning. We pray blessings on you. We love you. Uh, We hope you have a great week. Sweet.
shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I will bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art.